Okay, so I was asked um, what my name is. That's easy. It's James, James Boke. And where I call home, and that question is um, not so easy. Um, my father still lives in England, where I was born and where I lived until I was 18. And that's definitely a home. And since 2008, I've spent a significant part of each year in Mysore, South India, and I have a, a home there. There's a place that I've kept since late 2008. And when I was doing my Sanskrit master's program, I would be there from 2008 to 12. I spent about half my time there. And then every year since then, I've been there three or four months. And so that's definitely a home. And then there are a few other places where I've also felt a real sense of being at home and with people that I feel a strong connection to. So can't give a definitive answer to that one. I'd like to say wherever I am, but I'm recognizing I've still got a lot of work to do to be able to say that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I was asked how um, I really came to Kashmir Shaivism or how when I was exposed to that, it uh, really felt like home. So in the earlier conversation with Kira, uh, she mentioned how when I mentioned that, it was like, oh, there was this kind of recognition or this feeling of, yes, this is it. And um, I think the things that I found so inviting and resonant were in the Kashmir Shaiva yoga tradition, the basic teaching is Chaitanya Atma, which means everything is consciousness. And um, so it's the idea that everything is the means. You don't have to change your name. You don't have to change your appearance. You can practice wherever you are with whatever is around you. And so it's very inclusive. And for me, this is the true measure or a true benchmark for a, a practice that's really going to lead us towards greater cohesion and unity is that it includes. So I like to say that in yoga there's no exclusivity. Because if we want to experience harmony, then the only sustainable harmony is one that works with every part of ourselves. And in Kashmir they really emphasize that. And this can be illustrated by these beautiful pair of verses. Um, there's a story behind this which um, I quite like to tell. <laughs> There's a hymn called the Bhairavastava. And the Bhairavastava, the first time I went to Kashmir, which was, I think, 2009, I'd already been practicing some Kashmir recitation for several years that I'd learned from Larry, my teacher, who learned it from someone like Spanju. And in 2009, with Larry and Ellie, another of his students, uh, we studied together in Bangkok. We went to Kashmir, and as well as several hymns that we were already familiar with, I got to discover some new ones, including this fantastic hymn called the Bhairavastava, written by Abhinavagupta, this great master in the middle of the Kashmiri lineage. And uh, when I heard it, it felt really kind of familiar. I just loved it right from the first time I heard it. And in Kashmir at the ashram, that's where that's ashram, when they sing the Bhairavastava, which is 10 verses, and it's really kind of a distillation of all the teachings of Kashmir Shaivism, there are these two extra verses that they sing. And the story goes that Swami Vivekananda, this great polymath, <laughs> this great being, um, in, I think it was in the 19th century still, or maybe the early 20th century. No, it must have been still in the 19th century, I think. The story goes that he was sent to Kashmir and he was having a few doubts about the role of Mother Divine in, in yoga and in spirituality. He'd been uh, very familiar with the Vedantic schools of thought, which aren't so connected perhaps to this idea of nature being full of conscious power. And he was puzzled by it. And he had doubts about it. And the story goes that there he was, full of doubt, <laughs> and he met some sadhu who said, ah, oh, you go to Srinagar, go and see Swami Rama, then you'll he will clear your doubts. And so there's Vivekananda, and he finds Swami Rama's ashram in Srinagar, and it's still there. Then he goes in, and satsang is in course. 
And then at the end of the satsang, the devotees, they sing this hymn, the Bhairavastava. And it's, as I mentioned, a distillation of the Kashmir Shaiva viewpoint. And the story goes that Vivekananda, during the hymn, he gets it. All his doubts kind of dissolve. And then, because he's Vivekananda, on the spot, in the same Sanskrit meter, he composes an additional verse. And he says, Hari Reva Jagad Jagadeva Hari Hari to Jagato Nahibin Namanu Itiya Siyamativ Paramatagati Sanaro Bhavasa Garamotarati. So the story goes that the devotees finished the hymn. And Vivekananda erupts into this next verse, this additional verse, which is kind of summarizing what he's heard. He says, Hari Eva Jagat. So Jagat means the moving world of manifest creation. Eva is only Hari, is only the supreme. Jagat Eva Hari. And all, so the idea that the, basically all of this is supreme. And the supreme is only underlying all of this. Hari to Jagato Nahi Binnam Anu. There is not one anu, one atom, one iota of difference between the Supreme and all of this. Ityasyamatihi, one who comes to understand this, paramartagati, this is the Supreme means to do what? Bhavasagaram, the ocean of transmigratory worldly existence. Uttarati, tarati means to cross, uttarati, to leap across. And then, Swami Rama, being Swami Rama, pleased with Vivekananda's new understanding, adds an additional verse of his own. He says, yes, yes, he says, Aravante chittarasarupam madhye chittarasabodbodarupam bhatam bhatam bharupam syat no bhatan chintaram nasyat. So Swami Rama continued, Adao ante, at the beginning, at the end, chidrasarupam. It is the form of the essence of consciousness. Madhye, but in the middle, in this manifest time that we experience, buddha buddha rupam, it's like bubbles of consciousness rising up from the ocean of consciousness which underlies and enables and supports it all. And when consciousness rises up and comes into manifestation, how does it do it? Bhatam, bhatam, bharupam. Bhatam means shining, shining. Bharupam syat. It is full of what they call in Kashmir Shaivism, prakash, the self-effulgent light of consciousness. Because if everything in the creation, if everything in the manifest realm was not actually imbued with the self-effulgent light of consciousness. How could it exist at all? And so the idea, everything is consciousness. Everything is divine. Everything is the means. So this type of teaching, I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense to me. I can work with that. That says, yes, that's an invitation. It's not saying that because you're born in this country and you're following these protocols, you're superior to anybody else. It's just saying everything and everyone is part of this divine essence. So that was very alluring. That was like Krishna, yeah? Karshati, the one that draws you on. When I was exposed to this inclusive and very practical message, I thought, yeah, this is... This is worth exploring. And so then I did explore more through the Kashmir Shaiva lens, studying with Larry, going to Kashmir. And that's really kind of the, that was the initial principal foundation for my explorations in, in yoga. <laughs> so I've been asked a type of question which, if this was being filmed in the United Kingdom where I was from, nobody would even think to deign to ask you this type of question. But I've been asked, <laughs> Like the Kira, who's asked me the question, has said that I'm fond of talking about yoga being the unification of the gang, or the group, or the residents of this field, of this country, city, dwelling place that is our individual field of experience. And so she asked me, what parts of myself have I recently managed to 
include more through the practice. <laughs> so, it's 2015 today, and it's already the month of July. So, on the 30th of August 2013, my mother died, and I was with her, with my sister and my father. And my mum was diagnosed in 2010 with this disease called myeloma. Uh, it's a kind of cancer of the blood and bone marrow. And my mum and I had had a relationship that there were many beautiful things in it, and there were some things that maybe through my own willful ignorance, I had kind of projected problems onto it. And during those last three years, there was this tremendous healing. And then at the end, mm. I was able to meet my mother in a way I never had before. And I understood that the mother's love was just so much greater than I had eyes to see or the sense to feel. And this had a deeply, I would say, healing and transformative effect on my relationship to the whole of womankind and to the whole of the divine feminine because I have always had a lot of female friends. I have a sister I'm close to, I studied languages, so I was always around women a lot. But in my younger years, I had this kind of idea that I'm kind of a freak, you know, like, uh, some of the things I do in my life, when I was growing up, nobody else was into it. Nobody else was doing that. And there was a period in my life where I was quite isolated and really kind of uh, exploring by myself. And I think, and this was interesting because I was doing that in Thailand, which is a country which is very feminine, one might say, in terms of the energy that's dominant there. But I was doing a lot of masculine work. I was doing a lot of time alone, meditating, studying. And I think in recent years, the healing that I experienced with my mother, and when she, she was able to speak to me before she died from this place of just, this is like, she was in this place of complete love and acceptance. And I remember the day when she, we had to go to the hospital because the disease was actually killing her at that time. She was able to speak to me from this place. Inside, she said, everything's all right. And to, uh, to share that with her and be with her in that time was so deeply affirmative and clarifying cleansing for me. It just, the way that I was able to share time with my mum at the end, it just blasted through so much of my own delusion and willful self-sabotaging behavior about the idea that I could be accepted by another. And so since then I have have real experience of connecting with another in a way that feels much more integrating. And so I'm experiencing a much deeper and, let's say, disinhibited integration of relational intelligence and sexuality and certain aspects of my masculine essence which didn't have outlets to be expressed for many years just because at that time I had other work to do. But recently that's feeling like it's uh, now ready to happen because of other work that I was able to do at another time. So that's one thing I would say. Um, yeah, really just kind of the more integrating. I think what happened to me is that I went to Asia to teach. And in Asia, the teacher is somebody who is still very respected. Um, if you're sitting on the seat of the teacher in India, as I do when I'm in India, I offer courses and kirtan and classes and give talks. And so even though 
I'm very open. I'm not a, certainly no, and definitely, absolutely nothing like qualified to be a guru. I'm just sharing. I talk. I'm not teaching. I'm just sharing. But when you're sitting in the seat of the teacher, the cultural context means that people kind of look at you as a teacher. And I found that when I lived in Japan and then in Thailand, Thailand for several years and teaching at the university, and people would meet me and look at me as Adjan James, as James the teacher. And then in recent years, as I've been outside Asia more, in India where I'm sharing with a lot of my contemporaries and people who are very close friends of mine, and then teaching a lot more in the UK and Spain and recently in, on the American continent, I've found that I'm meeting a lot more people who, even if you know, they might really enjoy my, what I share or value the teaching, learning experience, they actually meet me as a human being. And so I think that's been helpful in integrating more of me. Because sometimes I'm like, oh, this is the teacher, and these are all the duties and roles of the teacher. And I'm very practiced in that. I've been teaching for 20 years, so I'm kind of really comfortable with that. But some of the other things, it's like, well, what about you as an individual? And um, I think I've been really fortunate that I've met. Going to Mysore, like when I, I left the university, and uh, I decided I want to make my living sharing what I love. That's what I'd done before, but then it changed. I want to share this yoga stuff, and particularly the philosophy, the mythology. And since I've done that, I've been doing that, I've met people who I feel so close to. So I've already mentioned my friend Thomas in Ibiza. And people with whom, you know, just such a deep connection. And that's been so encouraging and really helped me, I think, commit more to the path of just as best as I can, heeding the call of the heart and sharing what I want to share. So I think recently, I would say, in answer to that question, that I'm feeling the joy and confronting the painful lessons <laughs> of bringing more together, even those parts of myself that maybe didn't have so much chance to be exercised in previous decades, let's say. So um, I've been teaching here and there for quite some time. and. Only recently have I come to the US. I've been asked, what drew me to the US? Well, initially it was, I generally have gone to places where I've been invited. And in, in Mysore, it's kind of a center for, particularly for Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, but also there's a lot of yoga in Mysore. And many people from all around the world go there in the season to study and practice and explore. And so I've met people from all over the world and I was invited to the States and I came the first time in 2011. And then last year, 2014, with the family situation, it wasn't really appropriate for me to come, 2012, 13. Um, but then I got the visa, and several centers were interested in hosting me. And I was just keen to share more widely. What I've learned is that you know, everywhere one goes to share, it's always so different. And the different energy of the people, the different lenses of inquiry and the different cultural background make things come out differently. And I feel I've kind of also done a kind of apprenticeship in terms of sharing in non-native speaker environments. Because I love language and I love telling stories. And I try to make things kind of engaging and humorous. I try. And when it's a native language environment, there's a kind of, it's almost luxurious for me now. So they can really see new things. Like I love, I've had just a couple of opportunities to teach in French and Italian, and it's amazing what comes through when you share in a different language. And sometimes when I'm in Spain and we have interpreting, sometimes it's a little bit, you know, you might feel, oh, it goes more slowly because you have to interpret. But sometimes it actually allows more to come through because a lot of people will understand at least some of the translation or the original, and it brings more through. So I think in the States, because I'm British, so I speak the same language, but ever so slightly differently. It puts me in a kind of nice position to create a bridge with people because they recognize that, oh, this is something a little bit different, so a little bit curious. And many people here have said, well, 
we want what you do. <laughs> you know, like there's been, I think, in the States, like I mentioned earlier, Vivekananda, he came here such a long time ago, Paramahansa Yogananda. So many great real, yo real deal yogis came to the, the American soil. And there's been such high quality yoga asana instruction in the US for such a long time. And I always feel, you know, if you start exploring yoga through a practice modality such as asana or meditation or whatever it is, sooner or later you'll see the effect of that showing up in your life. And then often that creates or sparks a deeper curiosity. And um, I feel like the way I like to share, there is, there is a hunger for that here, perhaps. So that's what I've come to try and explore and, and share with people who are interested in bringing the teachings to life, you know? Because I'm, yeah, I've studied Sanskrit and I had some little background in various schools of Indian philosophy, but for me, the beauty and majesty of the yoga teachings, they're just so practical. And I think that's what we need in the world. And it's, you know, the US is a significant part of the world. And if, uh, if people are interested here, then I'm definitely keen to continue coming and hopefully sharing more and more widely and having fun sharing in that native language environment as I do. If there's anything I can share about, if you're on the path of being a yoga student, what, what things can help you? And I mean, it sounds like a cliche to say, you know, like, follow your heart or follow your longing. I mean, Joseph Campbell, this great comparative mythologist from the US, you know, follow your bliss. And, you know, follow that which makes all of you sing. You know, it comes about the Bhagavad Gita. It's like about making all of you sing. So I think if you're doing a practice and it's not making your whole being rejoice, take a close look at it. It's like the Upanishads tell us that we are sat, real, chit, conscious, and ananda. Blissful, full of bliss. I think if you're exploring practice, does it make you feel more present? Does it help you experience more in your life? Does it make you feel more chit, more conscious? Now, what might that mean? One way is it, it helps us, means we notice that we're doing things that are not really in our own highest interest faster than we used to. <laughs> and this is one way we can see chit is expanding. So am I more aware of if I'm really being honest, if I'm really being true to myself? And Ananda, is it making us, in the bigger scheme of picture, bigger scheme of things in the bigger picture, a little bit happier and more at home in our own skin? So I think just, be vigilant, you know. That's the very first teaching in the Gita, Pasha. Just pay attention and explore. Because I think yoga is about becoming your own, like, we, like Krishna says, be the sovereign of your experience, becoming your own authority. There's a lot of yoga out there now. And one of the beautiful things about this is it's inviting so many people to experience something of it. But just because something works for you at a certain time doesn't mean that's it. And it's really a path of continual exploration, so stay vigilant and enjoy it. And if you're not enjoying it, then look again. Is there another way to perhaps work a little bit more discerningly with it? I think that's the best I can offer right now. Um, so thank you. <laughs>